Hi everyone, welcome to week four of the U Revolution and this going deeper session. Hope you're enjoying them. Uh, we, we began the series by talking about the I God phenomenon, uh, then the U Revolution, set that up, and the seven words that make all the difference. Those seven words being, not my will but yours be done. And uh, when we went deeper, we looked at the, um, the surrender, uh, the pivotal, the, sorry, the catalyst moment of repentance, the defining statement of baptism, and then the pivotal points all across our lives that we need to take. Mm. The, the week after, we talked about uh, paradigm shift, and really we went deeper again with that, and then positioning. Uh, well, paradigm, I'm all about God, his cause, and the people he sure. loves. Um, that actually that it's um, proven over time and in our everyday work that uh, it's tested so that it can be trusted, mm. that it's um, proven when we're wronged and we still act upright, that every paradigm um, needs to be at some point forgotten, that tends to be the pattern, and then it's proven, uh, and then it shows up in how we leverage power. Right, then we talked about positioning, and obviously position, how we position our lives, what everything builds on, and one of the things we drilled deeper on was character, and so integrity of heart, um, godly character, the inner person, which is massive. And so and that brought us to last week, first things first, looking at those firsts that God commands us to use, F-I-R-S-T, F for first fruits, that we should honour God with the first of all we have, I for our issues, um, seek first the kingdom of God, don't concern yourself with the issues and worries and concerns, concern yourself with the kingdom um, R for relationships, first remove the speck out of your own eye and then you can see, <coughs> sorry, remove the plank out of your own eye, that's a Freudian slip, um, uh, so you can remove the speck of sawdust. Rela- yeah, relationships, that was relationships. S it was for sequence, the order, where Isaac built an altar to the Lord, he pitched his tent, looked after his family, dug a well um, and went to work, uh, that order of God first, looking after your household. And providing for your family as well in your everyday work. And then T was for time. That It's just obvious that there has to be a time allocation to our priorities. We can say our priorities look one way unless it shows up at a time allocation. But then, yeah, it doesn't say much. Hey, Bron, let's, let's get to it. And uh, I'd love to come back to the idea of um, the altar, the tent and work if we get time. But uh, if we don't, maybe you'll continue the conversation there. Let's talk love God, love people. I've heard plenty of people say, most people actually, most Christians would say they love God. And even if they get offended at times or a little bit out of sorts or got questions, they would say, yes, I love God. I've heard a lot of people say they don't love people or they struggle to love people because you can't say you don't love people. (laughs) They struggle to love people. And yet we know that it's vital, like this is vital. So can you talk to us about that? Um, Why it's so important, your thoughts around it. Well, um, yeah, really, we can go straight to the word on it. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 says this. It says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Wow. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So it's That's so true. vitally important. Um, That's not all, that's not all, but wait, there's more. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And then verse 10, uh, no, sorry, verse 20 says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So if we say we love God, but we struggle to love people, God's saying, you can't say you love me and not love others. Because often when we say we struggle to love people, what we mean is I really don't love people. So, so Bron, I'm just meditating on those verses. I haven't heard them, haven't read that for a while. Um, that, that, that's massive, right? And so how do we... What what are some ways that that just gets lived out that we can make that shift that loving people, uh, we're as devoted to that as loving God? Any thoughts? Well, it certainly, it definitely requires that mindset shift of accepting the gravity of it and the mm. weightiness of it. That in fact, that if this is what it says, 
if this is so close to the heart of God, then I need to ensure that this is so close to my heart. I can't just go through life accepting that I struggle to love people, accepting that that person, I, you know, I hate them, they're so annoying, or, or we wouldn't say that because the Christians would say, uh, you know, I struggle to love them or I struggle with that person. Mm. But really, on, essentially we don't love them or, um, or we say we, you know, love um, outsiders but we don't love Christians, whatever it looks like. Um, we have to say, no, God takes this very weightily. So, Brian, let's pick up where you, where you just left off there. And, you know, I've regularly heard many, many times that Christians will say, uh, I find it easier to love people, uh, you know, outside church who aren't Christians than I do to love Christians. Why do you, why do you think that is, Daz? Uh, obviously, expectation is, is massive. I'm sure proximity is too, but just thinking about expectation, I think we rightly expect more from Christians. Um, our lives should be changed. They should be f- full of grace. I mean, the two things there, sometimes Christians have way too much expectation on non-believers. They expect them to behave like believers, and we should make that very clear distinction. Um, but thinking about believers, we do have high expectations, but I think we need to show them grace, and we need to be kind to one another. And really, if you look at Jesus' disciples, who Jesus just extended love to them who were closest to him, who were making the most mistakes around him because of their proximity. Mm. Jesus was constantly setting them straight, but extending love to them and ultimately really set them up. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's paramount that we determine that we're going to love believers. It's not really an option no. to go, oh, I, I'll, I'll deal with the outsiders because it's easier. Yeah. In some ways, it's, it's like your immediate family. If your immediate family is complex, mm. um, it's easier not to deal with them because of your closeness. But they're the very people we're called to love. So, Brum, what, what, do, we do, what do we do? Well, I think we find the scripture um, answer right here in verse uh, 19 of chapter 4. Let's acknowledge, okay, it's not easy. Um, but this is what it says. We love because he first loved us. He first loved us. Now, let's go to verse 8 where it says, um, oh, no, that's what we read before. Um, You know, I think about this. We loved because he first loved us. And sometimes we think about God as the God who brings punishment and wrath and or wrath, however you want to say that. And Jesus is the one who rescues us from that. But we love because he, and it's talking about God, first loved us. Um, now let's look at verse 18, the verse preceding. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect f- love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So there's definitely a fear and reverence and awe that we have of God. But if there's that continued fear of punishment with God, then we haven't been perfected in his love yet. So um, verse 9 to 11 says this, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Mm. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So because God loved us, we ought to love one another. That's where we find the power. We love because he first loved us. Mm. It's where we find the strength. It's where we find the resilience. It's where we find the forgiveness because we ourselves have received all that. And if we see ourselves as only receiving that through Jesus and his sacrifice, we're only getting half the picture. God so loved us that he sent his son. God so loved. And it's a story right through scripture. Sometimes because of the Old Testament, we have this picture of the vengeful God, which, you know, we need to live in holiness and fear and reverence and awe in that way. But we should not, as believers, have this fear of punishment from God because that the Bible says we're not perfected in love if we do. So just the devotions go right into it. So I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes version. I encourage you, read the devotions. But the Cliff's Notes version of the Old Testament God story is that in the Garden of Eden, where the eye god phenomenon reared its head and was Mm -hmm. prevailing and very evident, uh, that we get the picture um, of God driving Adam and Eve out and there's artworks of the angel with the flaming sword and Adam and Eve bereft and naked and ashamed fleeing the garden. Mm. But the real story is that with the very first curse that God pronounced 
on the serpent, he immediately says there's going to be a way that there's mm, victory over you. Yeah. That's his first promise, is that humanity will have victory over mm. what the enemy has just done, and I'm going to ensure it mm. through um, a sacrifice. Then God makes the very first sacrifice in, recorded in history of an animal to clothe and cover mm. the shame of Adam and Eve, mm. and then he um, obviously sends them on their way. Read more about it in the devotion. The next thing is that the world is exceedingly wicked. Uh, God sends the flood. But then he makes a covenant with all of creation and says, I will never do that again. And sets the rainbow in the sky to remind him. He says, every time the rainbow appears, that will remind me that I'll never do this again. And actually, the bow is a sign of judgment. And he, he, the bow is shaped up to heaven. So the reminder is that he will carry the judgment on himself. Then we head into Abraham and Moses, and it's too much to go into. Read the devotions, but it is powerful what God has done all through, um, all through history for us in His covenants. And then we come to the new covenant. Daz, will you speak to us about the new covenant? So then, obviously, we come to the new covenant and Jesus, which is the fulfillment of everything. It's uh, and and He says, you know, in the New Testament, it's recorded. So this is a new covenant in my blood. He talks about doing this in remembrance of him. But that covenant speaks incredible things and predominantly love. Mm, absolutely. And in that, all the other covenants find their fulfillment. Mm. Um, God did take the judgment upon himself, like the rainbow said. Mm. Um, the, the serpent is crushed under the offspring of a woman. All those covenants find their fulfillment in Jesus. Oh, because the Abraham covenants where they split the animals and, and mm. God walks through yeah. and Jesus did in fact tear himself apart on our behalf. Yeah. It's so powerful. Um, so yeah, I guess, it, and even looking at the, the, where Jesus says that, where he first says a new commandment I give you if, and, and John, one John is written from there. It's in John's gospel that Jesus is saying, um, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And God says, you know, all through one John, it's all about obedience to me. And Jesus said, the new command I give to you is love one another. And it, it all comes together beautifully in this where he's giving the new covenant, where he's washing the disciples' feet, showing them what love looks like, even washing the feet of his betrayer, where he's saying, um, do what I command and, and love each other. It looks like you have to love each other. By, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, by loving each other. So we see this beautiful thing of the first and foremost commandment, how everything else is going to hang off it as we love mm -hmm. God. We're then able to love others. As we dwell on his love for us, we then are given the ability and the power to love others and everything else hangs from that. And in that, all those first things fall into place because, um, of course, we want to honor God with the first of our wealth because we love God. Mm. Of course, we seek first the kingdom and let our worries take care of themselves because we trust God, we trust in his love. Of course, our relationships flow better because we love each other and we look at ourselves first and say, well, what am I doing wrong? What can I do in this situation? Whose feet can I wash? Of course, we get the order right because we're loving God, we're loving people. And, um, and then everything else flows from that. And, of course, the time is being spent with God because we love Him. Mm -hmm. So we see why this command being the first oh. and foremost, the protos, the proton, the fundamental article on which everything else is built, why that matters so much. Brilliant. As I have loved you, so love one another. That takes on new meaning after listening to you for the last few minutes. So All right. I'm head to your discussion, and Daz is going to pray for us as we do. Great. Heavenly Father, thank you for everybody um, doing this study today. God, we, we just pray for your presence in each place, in each room, your spirit moving amongst, it, amongst us, your word doing its work. And Lord, um, may the fruit of today's gathering and today's study be that love grows, yes, Lord, God. in us, for you, um, for those around us, um, for people everywhere, and especially for the household of faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great time.